Hello, I'm Bruce Gewertz, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Surgical Chief here at Cedars-Sinai. And it's my pleasure to welcome Armin Giuliano, a very good friend and our Director of uh, Surgical Oncology. Armin, welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So Armin, we're, we're sort of interested in, in your background. I know you were born in New York and uh, give us the lowdown on uh, your education. I was born in New York, went to public high school, and went to Fordham University in the Bronx, New York, and then decided I should see the West. And I knew Chicago was in the Midwest. I thought I'd be right in the middle of the West. I should have looked at a map. So I went to the University of Chicago for medical school, and during those four years, realized I hadn't quite made it West. So I did my residency training at the University of California in San Francisco, finally made it to the West Coast. And we're glad that you did. How did you get interested in surgery to begin with? I got interested in surgery in medical school because I had a mentor, George Block, who was one of the premier surgeons in the United States. I took his rotation out of necessity. Uh, the University of Chicago had no chair at the time. You hadn't arrived yet, Bruce. And they were paying medical students $400 to uh, be interns on the surgical service because they didn't have uh, enough interns. And I decided I needed that $400 to uh, travel for my interviews. And my wife was a PhD student, so she wasn't working. George Block was the only service left by the time I decided to go for the 400. And uh, George was notoriously difficult. He was extremely demanding on medical students. Rounds started early in the morning, went late. And I thought, well, I really needed this $400. I wasn't interested in surgery at all. And I took his rotation and I saw what a real surgeon can do. And George really greatly influenced people's lives. He was a, a great surgeon and was very kind to patients. Although he was unkind to students, he was extraordinarily kind to his patients. He treated everyone as though they were kings and queens. And you really saw compassion in a surgeon, the ability to affect people's lives. And I thought, well, gee, maybe, maybe I could be like that. He wasn't kind to me as a student, but he was kind to his patients. <laughs> and he always had great, great pride in everything that you accomplished. And you describe him uh, very well. He was a complicated guy, but uh, very charismatic and a great inspiration to many of us. Now, you went to UCSF for your surgical residency, which has a long surgical history. And how did you get interested in oncology at UCSF? Well, that's another story of a mentor. I wanted to be a vascular surgeon. I love vascular surgery. As you know, in those days, UCSF had a very strong vascular department. We did a lot of vascular cases. It was very exciting surgery. It was uh, my favorite operation to this day is a carotid endarterectomy. And uh, I went to Dr. Blaisdell, who was the chief of surgery at San Francisco General, where I was rotating, and told him I wanted to be a vascular surgeon. And the next week, he called me to his office, and he said, uh, I've arranged for you to spend two years at UCLA with Don Morton. And I said, but uh, Dr. Morton's a, tr <laughs> he's a cancer surgeon, Dr. Blaisdell. He said, that's okay. He's doing great research. You'll learn about research, and you can apply it to vascular surgery. <laughs> so I told my wife we're going to UCLA. She was not happy because she was uh, getting her PhD and studying at Berkeley. So we drove to UCLA and I worked with Don and I really fell in love with surgical oncology. It's a very rewarding field and you get real close relationships with your patients. And Don was, as you know, a great researcher. So he got me interested in surgical research, which has been a, an important part of my career. Yeah, well, Don is, is, is obviously a, a remarkable uh, person, different than George, but with the same large footprint. And, and we both had the pleasure of being close friends with both of them, and, and I know it has enriched uh, both of our lives. Uh, yes. I know that Don uh, was one of the uh, proponents of the what's called the sentinel node biopsy, and I also know uh, that you were the one that made that sentinel node biopsy relevant to breast cancer. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what a sentinel node is and uh, how you made that contribution. So early on when uh, I was doing melanoma surgery, I did general surgical oncology when I started. And in melanoma and breast, we did routine lymph node removal. If you had a breast cancer, we removed all the lymph nodes under your arm to see if it spread. If you had melanoma, we removed the lymph nodes to see if it spread. And if you had melanoma in the middle of your trunk, 
we would remove lymph nodes from both armpits and both groins, which was a lot of surgery, and usually it was negative. And it, those operations, they were of no benefit to the patient, and they often had serious complications, arm swelling, leg swelling. So when Don was doing central node, trying it in melanoma, I was trying it in breast, and it wouldn't work. The skin lymphatics are much richer and more effective than the parenchymal lymphatics. So Don was getting it to work in the uh, melanoma because it was skin, and it wasn't working in the breast. And I went to Don, and I said, well, this will never work in the breast. I'm the first person to conclude that uh, central node biopsy would never work in breast cancer. And Don, to his credit, said, uh, Armin, research, research, search again, keep trying. So I had a surgical fellow come on the service, Dan Kurgan, and he said, why don't we organize this and try different variables than melanoma and see if we can get this to work. And so on a napkin in a bar at the American College of Surgeons, Dan and I outlined a series of studies that would investigate whether, in fact, central node biopsy would work. And we got it to work in breast cancer. And what it is, is you inject a dye or a radioisotope into the tumor, whether it's the melanoma of the skin, the tumor in the breast, or a, a colon cancer for that matter. And the lymphatics take up the dye. The dye goes to one lymph node. It's the first lymph node that drains the tumor. And that's the lymph node that will have the cancer if the cancer spread. So if you remove that lymph node and it's free, that means the cancer hasn't spread. So instead of doing these radical operations to remove all the lymph nodes in a patient's uh, axilla under her arm, you could just remove one lymph node. And if it's negative, you could stop. So the patients didn't have the long-term consequences of arm swelling, shoulder pain, Webb syndrome where they can't quite move their arm normally. So it, it made a difference in, in clinical patient management. Well, it surely made a difference, and it's an incredible contribution. And we're so proud that, that uh, you've been here at Cedars-Sinai to continue that work and other work. And uh, I think I can remind the audience that uh, Armin is one of the world's most recognized breast surgeons for the contribution that he just spoke of, but also for many other contributions uh, that he's made. So because in part of your work and because of better understanding of what you might call the biology of breast cancer, the treatment of the disease has changed dramatically over your career. Where do you see uh, the treatment going from here? Well, you're absolutely right. When uh, I was a medical student at the University of Chicago, many women had radical mastectomies. You would remove the breast, the muscle, the chest, the lymph nodes under the arm, a very deforming operation. And it progressed during my residency to a modified radical where you would leave the muscle. And that enabled the patients to have a reconstruction subsequently. Now, if a patient needs a mastectomy, we preserve the nipple, we do immediate reconstruction, and the breast looks virtually normal. So overall, breast cancer is getting kinder and more gentle. In addition to the central node for women who have no cancer in their lymph nodes, I did an international study where we looked at women who had cancer in the lymph nodes, and we found that for most women, you don't have to remove the lymph nodes even if there's cancer in them because we're getting more targeted therapy. Patients are getting specific chemotherapy, therapy that targets receptors on the cancer cell, HER2 receptors, ER receptors. And these patients get specific therapy that leads in tremendous improvements in overall survival. We're using chemotherapy and targeted therapy preoperatively now, and 50, 60, 70% of the time for certain cases, the tumor has gone away. So I'm working with one of our s fellows on designing a study where we can omit radiation for these patients. So less is more. We're doing more specific, more gentle, effective therapy, and less radical therapy. And this will continue to evolve. I think we will see more targeted therapy. We'll see genomics where we find out what mutation is in the patient's tumor, and can we target that mutation itself so 
it's getting to be very sophisticated, very exciting, targeted therapy, which is less and less radical and much easier on the woman with cancer. Yeah, it's a f fantastic story. And, you know, I, I know that there are certain <clears throat> types of breast cancer, whether it's their microscopic invasion characteristics or their hormone uh, susceptibility that make a difference. And I don't want to have to go through each one of those. But overall, if you were to take breast cancer patient in 2021 and a breast cancer patient 15 years ago, what has been the change and improvement overall in the survival of breast cancer? Well, the survival now depends very much on what the genomics, what the mutations, what the characteristics of the tumor is. So 15 years ago, if you had a HER2 positive tumor, that's a tumor in which this oncogene called the HER2 oncogene is highly expressed. That was a very bad tumor. That was a tumor that had a very high mortality, maybe 50, 60% mortality at five to seven years. Now that same tumor, because of anti-HER2 therapy, largely the drug called Herceptin, has the most favorable prognosis in breast cancer. So we're seeing tremendous changes in prognosis based on a better understanding of the biology. We're seeing also improvements in survival based on early detection. If you have a mammographically detected tumor, the survival is in excess of 90% at five years compared to a large palpable tumor or one with lymph nodes spread. So early detection, targeted therapy has greatly improved overall survival. And I'm very familiar with the fact that breast cancer is uh, one of these cancers that can recur over long periods of time and that people that have recurrence can live long periods of time with appropriate therapy. And in fact, even on television now, there are constantly ads for different chemotherapeutic and immunogenic, I assume, agents that allow people to live with metastatic breast cancer for more years. You want to just give us some insights about that? Yes, even though breast cancer has spread, and 15 years ago it would be a death sentence, now there are therapies where women live normal lives with metastatic breast cancer 10, 15 years, some of my patients with metastases where 15 years ago, you would have predicted them to be dead in a few years. Now they're alive 10 and 15 years later. Many of them have high, very high normal quality of life. Uh, Anti-hormone therapy, drugs like tamoxifen, which most patients have heard of, are very effective in controlling metastatic and recurrent disease. And patients do quite well. It's not a, it's not a death sentence anymore. It's not something to be as afraid of as it once was. One of the controversies And in patients that have a history of breast cancer in their family versus patients who have no obvious family history, when do you recommend women get their first mammogram and how frequently should they get a mammogram? Well, I think part of the controversy in mammography relates to the cost. What does it cost to save one life and what should we as a society be willing to pay? So if you do mammographies in young women, you're not going to find many cancers. So the cost per life saved is very great. And many organizations have recommended starting mammography later, mainly because of the cost and, uh, and efficacy of screening mammography. But to me, a, an average woman in the US, an average woman has a high chance of breast cancer. I think they should get mammograms at age 40, which is the recommendation of the American College of Radiology. Uh, women with a family history should know their genetics. We're doing genetic testing now that detects genes that cause breast cancer in women. Women with a strong family history should have a genetic test. and It's a very easy test. It's just a mouthwash where they look at the, the genes in the oral mucosa. And you can see if the patient has a probability of having a gene that will cause cancer in, in her lifetime, whether breast cancer or other cancers. The most common uh, breast cancer causing gene is the BRCA gene, BRCA. There's BRCA1 and 2, which are very common in our population here at Cedars because the Ashkenazim 
uh, the Eastern European Jews have a high probability of a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So we t test many of our patients for these mutations, and we find many of them who have an inherited mutation that leads to breast cancer, and you can do then, at that point, either intensive screening so that if they get it, you find it early and it's life-saving, or you can do prophylactic surgery, prophylactic mastectomy like Angelina Jolie did, or prophylactic removal of the ovaries. So there's a lot that can be done to prevent the breast cancer or detect it early. So d maybe to end our discussion with uh, going back to the sort of history of this disease when you and I were both in medical school, uh, one of the uh, most important tenets was that women needed to self-examine their breasts, learn how to do it properly so they could recognize uh, lesions uh, at, at a relatively early stage, not as early as microscopic as detected by uh, mammograms. Is self-exam still the tenet, the main tenet, of uh, discovery of breast cancer? No, self-exam has uh, fallen into disrepute. It's very hard for women to do it. Uh, they're afraid to do it. And it turns out that they don't really detect cancers very early. But in my opinion, either your doctor will feel it, you'll see it on a mammogram, or you, the patient, will detect it yourself. So I see no harm in self-examination. If the patient can do it and is willing to try, then it's worth doing. But it certainly doesn't substitute for the comments you made about genetic testing and mammography. No, not at all. Well, terrific. Armin, thank you so much for spending time with us and for the great work that you're doing here at Cedars-Sinai Cancer Institute. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be at Cedars-Sinai.